Okay, so now we need to go through the mechanism for this reaction. Uh, let's go through this together. Uh, any suggestions here? And now we're not any, any light here. So we're done with our radical mechanisms. Right. And then um, it's going to the top and then going to attach the double bond is going to attack one BR. And it's well why would it attack one BR? Yeah, that's a good question. So let's stop and think about this. Now, why is it reasonable for the double bond to be at the tail? Because it's a good nucleophile, because it's a carbon. Carbon pi yeah, this is a decent nucleophile. Not great, but decent because it's a carbon-carbon pi bond. But this does not look like an electrophile, does it? This does not look like an electrophile because it has no charges um, on it. Um, nevertheless, it turns out that this is an electrophile for this particular reaction. We basically just have to memorize this. We basically have to memorize this. Um, the official justification for this is, so there is no partial positive here, right? Because these are both the same electronegativity. There is no permanent dipole here. However, remember that in the molecule, the electrons are always moving around at random. So there can be a temporary dipole. There could temporarily be a positive charge here and a negative charge here. This always kind of struck me like a kind of hand-waving explanation, but this is probably how your yeah. instructor explained it in class. So. Have been any case. <laughs> that is an excellent point. The yes. Are yes. <laughs> what is this so called? Every reaction will this reaction? Um, this would be called, I suppose, a halogenation. Um, dihalogenation? What did I call it in the handout? It's another electrophilic addition. I just called it a halogenation. Uh, I don't think the name here is too quote important. Uh, a lot of these names are not too important. All right, but I agree with that criticism. Um, this whole business with the temporary dipoles is not very satisfying because then you could say that for anything. Uh, but the good news is I think this is the only this is the only temporary dipole you'll see in the whole course. This is the only temporary dipole you'll see in the whole course, which means that we can just forget about the whole temporary dipole thing and just memorize that this happens to be an electrophile even though you wouldn't expect it. All right, maybe that's the best way to deal with this. We're just going to memorize that double bonds, double bonds can attack XX, um, even though we might not have expected it. Um, if you take a look oh, at the... Oh, not just BRBR? BR? Yeah, it could be CL, CL, BRBR, BR, II. As usual, it wouldn't do it with fluorine. We're not really doing anything with fluorine in this course. But except for fluorine, it could uh, attack anything here. If you take a look at the reactivity handout that I gave you, I say this in the reactivity? Yeah. So if you take a look at the reactivity handout, uh, I went through some electrophiles that you might see. Uh, and one thing I just added is XX reacting with the carbon-carbon pi bond. Uh, XX reacting with the carbon-carbon pi bond uh, is another example of an electrophile. We're basically just going to memorize this. Uh, and this is the only reaction where this would act like an electrophile, only with the carbon-carbon pi bond. So we're just going to memorize this as an exception to the normal rules. Uh, all right, so a lot of things no can we try to understand, but this kind of just has to be memorized. All right, so uh, XX reacting with carbon carbon pi bond is uh, our reaction here. Now, this is actually very complicated. We're not done here yet. This is the case where we're going to form that cyclic intermediate. Uh, now, the way to do that is at the same time that the bromine is getting attacked by this carbon, that same bromine is going to be attacking this carbon. Otherwise, it wouldn't form that cyclic intermediate. And this Don't you need an arrow going? Like this? Absolutely. So this is three whole arrows. So there's a lot of things happening here that we haven't really seen before. So it would be easy to forget how to do this. So that would give us this. And let's see if we can draw the right product here. I like this one. I love this one. Why would you know that it's wedged? Let's get rid of the deuterium here. We don't need the deuterium. So I'm going to take out the deuterium, first of all. Remember here that the bromine, at the same time that the bromine is getting attacked by the top carbon, it's attacking the bottom carbon simultaneously, concertedly. So we will form a cyclic intermediate. And um, we're attacking somebody trigonal planar. So do we expect two products or one product? Two. Two. So we should also be getting... And, uh, yeah, let's try this. Does it not matter that the other, that the deuterium was wedged? 
I regret that we put in the deuterium. Let's forget the deuterium. So yeah, let's erase the deuterium. We don't need that to understand this reaction. We can just do this. So uh, let's erase the deuterium. Let's just suppose this is cyclohexane. We'll just start with a normal cyclohexane. If the deuterium was there, then would it just only be dashed? I don't think it would make any changes, no. How about if there's a methyl? <laughs> um, it might, then you might have fewer uh, from the dashed, but you would still have some of both. Okay, okay. and then we can uh, get to that uh, later. Those are some good points, but let's start with the basic idea. Okay, so that gives us this. So the po key point here is this bromine is going to attack from either in front or from behind. It's attacking someone trigonal planar, so it can attack from either in front or from behind, so it can end up on the wedges here or on the dashes. Oh, well, actually, in this case, it doesn't make any difference because these are the same thing, aren't they? Yes. These are the same thing. So uh, in this case, I'll just draw one of them. All right. These happen to be turned out to be the same thing. But the bromine can attack from either direction. Maybe I should have had that deuterium in there. No, that would, that would be too complicated. All right. So um, that would give us this. By the way, if this is a wedge, this has to be a wedge, right? Because obviously the bromine, it would be too contorted to be attached by a wedge to one carbon and a dash to the other. If the bromine is in front of the page for this carbon, it must be in front of the page for the other carbon. Cool, but contorted. OK, so we will get that cool. All right, so uh, let's see. So that gives us this as our intermediate. So let me point out again how complicated this reaction was. At the same time that the pi bond attacks this bromine, the bromine attacks the bottom carbon, and the other carbon and the other bromine leaves. So there's a three whole things happening at the same time. So you have to draw in this lone pair. We have to draw in this lone pair for the bromine to attack down here. All right, what would be a logical thing to have happen now? Oh, and I, I messed up. the charges. I? Yeah, I forgot the charges. Um, so how can I do uh, charges here? Um, this is complicated because there really isn't exactly an initial tail or head. But notice this bromine is gaining one electron, gaining one pair, and losing two pairs. So it must end up positive. This bromine is at one head and two tails. So it's going to have to end up positive. It's losing more electrons than it's gaining. Uh, basically, these arrows cancel each other out. These arrows cancel each other out. But if you look at this arrow, the bromine is losing these electrons, so it ends up positive. And this bromine is gaining the electron, so it ends up negative. So uh, as usual, the charges are important. So this is called a cyclic intermediate. Uh, this is not called bromine. Since it's charged, it's called bromonium. Uh, when you have a charged ion, that's called an onium. So this is bromonium, a cyclic bromonium ion. Bromonium. That's right. So you guys should already be familiar with hydronium, and this is bromonium. And then the BR attacks the BR, and then it becomes a BR-BR. So you're suggesting that the bromine should attack this BR over here because it has the positive charge? Now, that really? seems logical. However, of it's not. isn't it going to attack, like, disconnect, like when we had yes, obviously like cyclothane? Like like yeah, so here's something that I wanted to have some time to talk to you guys about. So um, sometimes when someone has a positive charge, you attack the thing with the positive charge. And sometimes you attack the thing that it's connected to. We've seen some examples of that. There's actually a way to tell which one it is. Let's actually take a look at the, the handout. This is actually is something that might help you here. This is the handout on reactivity. Take a look at the handout on reactivity. Uh, so we're looking at the top of the handout on reactivity. This one here. This one here. OK. Um, and notice here, um, we want to see the effect of charges on reactivity. Well, notice that there's two rows with positive charges two different cases where you can have a positive charge. Um, it all depends on whether you have an incomplete octet or not. If you have an incomplete octet, then the thing with the positive charge is the electrophile. But if it has a complete octet, then the thing that it's attached to is the electrophile. So the example I gave in the handout was If the atom with the positive charge has an incomplete octet, then it's an electrophile. That makes sense because it really needs more electrons to get that complete octet, and then it would go at the head of the arrow. But if the atom with the positive charge has a complete octet, then surprisingly, it's the atom it's attached to that's the electrophile. 
All right, this is actually a really helpful principle that you can use for the whole rest of the course, because we're going to see many cases with positive charges, and in many cases, it's not the atom with the positive charge that gets attacked. It's the one that's next to it. And the reason is, usually the thing with the positive charge already has a full octet. What's the point of attacking someone with a full octet, in a sense? Um, so then the arrows would look like this. Uh, this is also in the handout. So if the thing with the positive charge uh, has a complete octet, it's the thing that it's attached to that acts like the electrophile. So in this case, Y would be the electrophile, but in this case, X would be the electrophile, because it has an incomplete octet. So those are the, uh, if you look at the table at the top of the reactivity handout, the, the last two rows compare the two cases with positive charges. So this is actually going to come up a lot in the course. This is a good thing to make a flashcard of.